My name is Michelle Van Veek. I'm originally from Namibia, but I've been living in South Africa and working there for the past 20 years. So we, although I grew up in, in Namibia and schooled in Namibia, they, um, what I wanted to study, which was um, jewelry manufacturing and design, wasn't available at the time. And so I went to South Africa. So now I teach in the university that I studied in and I teach in the design department. Um, and I'm currently doing my PhD in Lapland. So it's quite three different um, landscapes, I suppose, especially with regards to the arts. Um, being in South Africa and then coming back to Namibia has also shown me how much growth has taken place. So um, it's been interesting. So I usually call myself a Nams African when people ask, uh, where are you from? Uh, just because I've been living in both countries for so long. And um, artistically, I, I make jewelry, but I'm also starting to explore spaces around um, decolonizing design and what does it mean to decolonize design and what are the, the practical elements you need to consider when you are um, exploring decolonizing design, especially because you need to to understand that there are so many elements that influence it. So I started with my own practice, um, which was jewelry making. Um, and so I think that is where I'm currently at. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm learning quite a lot and it's feeling very uncomfortable most times. Um, I feel very lost a lot of times in the artistic practice, but it's such an adventure. I think I've got two answers. So the one is what we've been taught, um, especially from a Western perspective, what, what or a Northern perspective, what um, art education is, which is the idea of learning about mostly Western focused arts methods and Western arts um, and kind of approaching um, I suppose indigenous arts in a different way as well. That's been my experience in my training. What I believe it to be now is it's a practice that should and does enhance what um, creatives already have within themselves. And so the methods are different. I'm learning. It's not necessarily only about reading in a book, but um, exploring different ways of being creative and, and being outside, engaging your environment, instead, um, engaging what you already know, what you grew up with, um, more an intrinsic approach versus an external approach. Um, and I suppose these are the two um, conflicting concepts that I hold. Um, and it's not to say that one is more valuable than the other. It's just that it's now different knowledge systems that inform one another. So where the one lacks, the other one can supply in both ways um, and in equal measure. Within the cultural con context, I think culture plays a big role in artistic practice. Um, within our region um, and first of all needing to create a pathway for for students or those learning or wanting to enter this world of artistic practice creating and uh, connection with them so that they are able to um, trust you and take you on this and, and allow them to take you on this journey so a lot of creative practice is related to trust I suppose in our um, context um, and needing to demystify it because there seems to be this mystery around artistic practice and what it should look like and you know who you should be and what you should know and and I think a part of that is taking away those dimensions and and revealing it to be something that you already have and now creating a pathway or creating sp learning spaces where you can express that so um, equipping equipping students with different tools to help them express what they have. I definitely believe that 
one example was actually a, a project that we were involved in. We we um, went into work with with a group of students that were that were working in an ad- indigenous heritage um, site. So it was from a specific community, and they were basically. Uh, they had asked students or, or young people, youth, to come from these areas, and they had now um, created these different um, areas that they could go into. gardening they go into um, art creation they go into tours and we did a workshop there with printmaking um, that actually drew on the stories that the students had and um, knowledge that they had as well with regards to making traditional jewelry and so they were then able to tell stories and and create um, a print that would um, display their story in a different way in a technique that they hadn't used before so um, I think that was a good example of of introducing something a tool to students that already had creative capacity but hadn't necessarily expressed it in that way and they had made these prints and we framed them and they could then um, take them home as well and they had them on the graduation ceremony which was um, fantastic the beautiful thing about this experience was that it was a method that students could um, duplicate within their home setting. So minimal resources, um, whether it's in a remote setting, you need not have much um, materials, I suppose, but you're still able to be creative. Um, and just highlighting that for them was was really um, great. And then also taking them into a museum to display to show them that this is where that kind of artwork actually lands up because the problem often is that I've seen um, in terms of arts education is that students don't always know where their um, skills can be utilized or where they 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 can how or how they can earn an income from what they do. Um, so I think that was a um, quite a good example and then one example I'd like to highlight for myself is I did a project with my first years where they are so used to working with silver and and um, making specific jewelry items that they've got this idea of what jewelry looks like um, and I asked them to collect um, non-precious materials so it could be something they picked up it could be costume jewelry it could be um, broken parts of something as well Um, anything that was non-conventional jewelry and then they needed to take um, some of the jewelry making skills so how you would finish a piece of jewelry polish it it needs to be straight um, it needs to be symmetrical so those elements of design but then bringing it in an artistic way where they were would create a ramp piece of jewelry so Normally, they wouldn't create such large pieces of jewelry, but now because of the size, they were able to creatively incorporate many different elements. And students were, I mean, they produced such amazing pieces where they um, took broken pieces of, of car lights, some um, took plastic pearls from a broken um, costume jewelry piece, and they cut them in half and they created these beautiful um neck pieces some had spray paint on their pieces as well but they had incorporated in different knowledge systems and then created these beautiful pieces so I think that was like a really um, good example for me of artistic practice within something that is usually defined as design Um, Mm -hmm. because there seems to be this differentiation between arts and design I will, I will have a look of the photos of, of Kwatu, the ones for um, the jewelry. It was quite a few years ago. And unfortunately, I didn't take pictures of that. But um, I mean, I can try and reach out to a student and see if they've got some. Um, 
because I think that and then before I was in research, I didn't realize the capacity of documentation and actually also just keeping a visual um, design diary of what it is that you are doing, mm -hmm. you know, you kind of, and I think that's the problem, you know, you see every, you see certain things as, as everyday or non-common because you've been trained in this way that what is precious or what is valuable, but actually that even the, the non-conventional is is important to to tell your story you know um yeah and, I, and i'm hoping to see a lot more of that in in our region as well you know within our context specifically i think it's actually the story that sells the the jewelry piece it's not necessarily only um what you're making it from um because i think the materiality challenges or working with materials challenges um concepts that the students themselves have or belief systems that they themselves have and those things remain unchallenged until you work with the material so until you you're told take something that you picked up and make it precious And how do you do that? Like, what does that process look like? Why do you think something is precious? Why do you think something is not? And, and those conversations are unlocked in that artistic practice of you don't know exactly wh at what point does something become precious? At what, at what point does it become valuable? Um, and then having those conversations with yourself is, is easier because you're working with materials that trigger those questions. Um, in a way that allows you to to look at the material, engage it, but then also um, think about it. Because often, I think before we are trying to tell the story to someone else, we're trying to we need to understand the story ourselves, which is what I found in my own creative practice. You know, um, why do I think that jewelry only needs to be made with gold and diamonds? Why? Can it not be made with other materials, but still be precious? So what, what, where does this idea of preciousness come from? Um, you know, is it in the artistic practice? Is it in the skill? Is it in, and I found a lot of it is in the narrative. It's telling the story of, you know, um, I wanted to make something from sustainable materials. So I started to work with bone and I started to make bone precious and I started to explore bone and what bone can do. And in that you both scientifically unlock the materials potential, but also you start to innovate creatively and it becomes art. Documenting that process becomes art. The jewelry becomes something called an epistemic object, which is an object with a story. Yeah. Um, and documenting that is part of your artistic practice. So the value is the story. Yes. And it helps you to see things that often remain invisible. Um, when you start to document, that's the value I've seen is that you make, you expose the things that normally um, remain dormant or invisible. And I think it also, um, in a strange way, it, pay, it paces creativity as well. It allows you to, to take your time with it because often we're living in, in a world where you need to meet deadlines. You need to, so the end becomes very important and the end product and the delivery becomes important. And then we lose all of this um, weaving and beauty in the middle. But documenting that forces you to slow down and look and um, observe. And I think those are important practices in, in, in artistic practice is to slow down and look and understand um, what it is you're doing, what it is you're looking at, what it is you're feeling, what it is you're thinking. 
um, and then make from that place um, versus rushing towards the end. So it's quite a different approach. It allows you to, or it very much um, mimics time that you have to spend with yourself as well. So you can't separate the two. Whereas perhaps in other dif disciplines, you've got the ability to be able to function and be productive, but you are actually most productive um, artistically when you've got this ability to stay, to remain, to be intentional um, about what it is that you're doing. And somehow that is that is translated into your material and into your into your art. And so, the idea of not controlling the outcome is actually where you get the beauty revealed, where you get the innovation revealed. Um, yeah. And it and, and you know, the, just talking about this, sometimes I think it it um, it's difficult to explain um, from us in a southern context because we've been told that productivity and um, success and efficiency looks like a particular thing. So we are fighting um, this idea of what success is, what beauty is, what, and it happens in so many different ways. And so there's very little room for experimentation or for things that look ugly, whatever that means, yeah. you know, like there's no, there's no time for ugly, there's no time for incomplete, there's no time for processing or figuring it out. It needs to be, how do you get from the beginning to the end in the quickest way because this thing needs to be something. Um, and I think that's what the arts war against because they, they, they when, you, when you start to function like that, there's so much that gets lost along the way. Um, and artists aren't always equipped to explain that to external audiences. I think the where there's room for for growth and and if we can find methods to assist artistic um, or creatives to express what it is that they're doing in a way that allows them to not have to explain themselves. Uh, or justify rather justify this themselves um, because often I find that as a creative I'm, I'm explaining that what I do is valuable whereas a doctor doesn't need to do that or an engineer doesn't need to do that specifically but the arts almost seem like this additional mm -hmm. you know um, extra that is, it's like you do it on the side, you know, you don't do it as a, a whole. Oh. I would say that we need to reevaluate if, if what we know about the arts and how to do the arts is valuable. And, and current for us right now? Has it been working? Um, does it allow us to show up in, in, um, in a way that allows us to, to express all of us in a unique way, in a Southern way? Um, because I find that just through my own creative practice and, and starting to unpack how I've been doing things that there's more than one way to do something and it's and I've only experimented with so many because those are the ones that I was formerly taught but I think we need to develop as southern creatives our non-formal ways of being creative and of learning and 
yeah, develop a, a toolbox that suits our context, whatever that looks like. And I, f- I found that often it starts with your own creative practice, needing to start to um, become uncomfortable in the fact that, so you start to question, is this the best way? And if not, you know, could I do it a different way? And if, what does that different way look like? Are there things that I have missed out on um, within my own context that I could be incorporating? And and how do I, what are the steps of, of looking at those things? Because the hardest part for me was I didn't know how to do things differently. I didn't know how to not think this way because I've been thinking this way for so long, you know. Um, and so I think that kind of ties in with experimentation as well and um, a lot of self-reflection, you know, just your artistic reflective practice is so important because we need to question things. We need to question approaches um, and explore the answers that we're getting, you know, within individ- on an individual level, on a, on a one, one to another level, and then in a community level, because I think even within the context of my classroom, um, allowing students to ask those same questions and sitting in a space where you don't have the answers, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the answers aren't out there. Um, and it doesn't mean that things cannot be done differently. You perhaps just haven't figured out a way how to do it differently. So um, in summary, I suppose we need to explore what different looks like for us. Um, yeah, and make time and space for that. PhD, because I'm doing an article-based PhD, was looking at this idea of a brief you know, when I'm working with students and briefing them. So this is what we want, it, want you to do. This is the outcome. This is how you do it. And where there's room for creativity, like how are we limiting that? And so I started to um, look at all the ways that that ex- actually excludes students. And then I thought, okay, well, what would be inclusive for an, for an African context, you know? And I thought, okay, fine, music is a good way to cross language barriers and then I thought okay well do something completely um, non-conventional whereas in class you'd be sitting so okay let's lie down you know so I was lying down on the floor listening to music thinking about the rhythm listening to the rhythm and then trying to incorporate that into a piece of clay so trying to what I felt in the music, trying to push that into clay and let that be my starting point for designing something to wear in jewelry. Um, and in that way, I had no correct way to do it. But the creativity level was like through the roof because now my options were so many and so wide and starting to look into why, why did that feel so wrong? It felt like I wasn't serious, you know, or like it's not legitimate it's not a it's not a way to learn and then but I felt like it made on another level it made complete sense to me to do it like this because this if I imagine creativity that's what the word comes up you know and and how this this concept of creativity and artistic education clashes because it feels like in in institutions there's the structure and curriculum and hours and outcomes and pass rates and then you've got this creativity which is like unfolding constantly on itself you know and how do you bring those two together um i think that's the challenge for us because i think part of being seven is that you you don't have a shape, you don't have a form, you constantly over bubbling over, you know, so, um, and that's, I think that's what sets us apart as well, from a certain perspective, that's what sets us apart, is that there's this um, constant need, there's like an internal movement constantly, and that's the creativity, and it, it expresses itself in different ways, whether it's through music, or food, or 
culture or what we wear. Um, there's just so much energy that needs to be translated into creativity. And so squeezing ourselves into these very structured practices can be difficult. And then we, we judge ourselves. But yet I think where we can go is unlimited if we find a different space to fit into. Call it a state of flux. So it's constantly. Yes. Yeah. Movement and flexibility. Yes. Mm -hmm. Very important. Mm -hmm.